Life is complex. Join us for the simple gifts of wisdom, love, and delight in the written word. The 95 Theses of Martin Luther, Theses 1 through 29. The 95 Theses, The Disputation on the Power and Efficacy of Indulgences, posted October 31st, 1517, the eve of All Saints' Day, Castle Church, Wittenberg, Germany. Four Oral Debate, on November 1st, 1517. Out of love and zeal for truth, and the desire to bring it to light, the following theses will be publicly discussed at Wittenberg under the chairmanship of the Reverend Father, Martin Luther, Master of Arts and Sacred Theology, and regularly appointed lecturer on these subjects at that place. He requests that those who cannot be present to debate orally with us will do so by letter. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. The first three theses statements are for discussion on the importance of God's Word in the Holy Bible for the Christian's life. 1. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, Matthew 4.17, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. 2. This word cannot be understood as referring to the sacrament of penance, that is, confession and satisfaction, as administered by the clergy. 3. Yet it does not mean solely inner repentance. Such inner repentance is worthless unless it produces various outward mortifications of the flesh. Theses number 4 through 14 address the power of the Pope, challenge the teachings of purgatory, address the corruption of the clergy, and the source of the forgiveness of sins as a direct act from God. 4. The penalty of sin remains as long as the hatred of self, that is, true inner repentance, until our entrance into the kingdom of heaven. 5. The Pope neither desires nor is able to remit any penalties except those imposed by his own authority or that of the canons. 6. The Pope cannot remit any guilt except by declaring and showing that it has been remitted by God, or, to be sure, by remitting guilt in cases reserved to his judgment. If his right to grant remission in these cases were disregarded, the guilt would certainly remain unforgiven. 7. God remits guilt to no one unless at the same time he humbles himself in all things and makes him submissive to his vicar the priest. 8. The penitential canons are imposed only on the living, and according to the canons themselves, nothing should be imposed on the dying. 9. Therefore, the Holy Spirit through the Pope is kind to us insofar as the Pope in his decrees always makes exception of the article of death and necessity. 10. Those priests act ignorantly and wickedly who, in the case of the dying, reserve canonical penalties for purgatory. 11. Those tares of changing the canonical penalty to the penalty of purgatory were evidently sown while the bishops slept. Matthew 13.25 12. In former times, Canonical penalties were imposed not after, but before absolution, as tests of true contrition. 13. The dying are freed by death from all penalties, are already dead as far as the canon laws are concerned, and have a right to be released from them. 14. Imperfect piety or love on the part of a dying person necessarily brings with it great fear and the smaller the love, the greater the fear. Theses number 15 through 82 are the core arguments by Martin Luther against indulgences 
and the tactics of the preachers who are selling letters of indulgence in Germany. 15. This fear of horror is sufficient in itself to say nothing of other things, to constitute the penalty of purgatory, since it is very near the horror of despair. 16. Hell, purgatory, and heaven seem to differ the same as despair, fear, and assurance of salvation. 17. It seems as though for the souls in purgatory, fear should necessarily decrease and love increase. 18. Furthermore, it does not seem proved, either by reason or scripture, that souls in purgatory are outside the state of merit, that is, unable to grow in love. 19. Nor does it seem proved that souls in purgatory, at least not all of them, are certain and assured of their own salvation, even if we ourselves may be entirely certain of it. 20. Therefore the Pope, when he uses the words, plenary remission of all penalties, does not actually mean all penalties, but only those imposed by himself. 21. Thus, those indulgence preachers are in error who say that a man is absolved from every penalty and saved by papal indulgences. 22. As a matter of fact, the Pope remits to souls in purgatory no penalty, which, according to canon law, they should have paid in their life. 23. If remission of all penalties whatsoever could be granted to anyone at all, certainly it would be granted only to the most perfect, that is, to very few. 24. For this reason, most people are necessarily deceived by that indiscriminate and high-sounding promise of release from penalty. 25. That power which the Pope has in general over purgatory corresponds to the power which any bishop or curate has in a particular way in his own diocese or parish. 26. The Pope does very well when he grants remission to souls in purgatory, not but the power of the keys, which he does not have, that is, does not extend to purgatory, but by way of intercession for them. 27. They preach only human doctrines who say that as soon as the money clinks into the money chest, the soul flies out of purgatory. 28. It is certain that when money clinks in the money chest, greed and avarice can be increased. But when the church intercedes, the result is in the hands of God alone. 29. Who knows whether all souls in purgatory wish to be redeemed, since we have exceptions in St. Severinius and St. Pascal, as related in a legend. That is, both of these popes desired to stay in purgatory longer than necessary, to receive greater glory in heaven. Tis the gift to be simple. Tis the gift to be free. Tis the gift to come down where we ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, t'will be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we will not be ashamed. To turn, turn, will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. Life is complex. Join us for the simple gifts of wisdom, love, and delight in the written word. The 95 Theses of Martin Luther Theses 30 through 58. 30. No one is sure of the integrity of his own contrition, much less of having received plenary remission. 31. The man who actually buys indulgences is as rare as he who is really penitent. Indeed, he is exceedingly rare. 32. 
Those who believe that they can be certain of their salvation because they have indulgence letters will be eternally damned together with their teachers. 33. Men must be especially on their guard against those who say that the Pope's pardons are that inestimable gift of God by which man is reconciled to him. 34. For the graces of indulgences are concerned only with the penalties of sacramental satisfaction established by man. 35. They who teach that contrition is not necessary on the part of those who intend to buy souls out of purgatory or to buy confessional privileges preach unchristian doctrine. 36. Any truly repentant Christian has the right to full remission of penalty and guilt, even without indulgence letters. 37. Any true Christian whether living or dead, participates in all the blessings of Christ and the Church, and this is granted him by God, even without indulgence letters. 38. Nevertheless, papal remission and blessing are by no means to be disregarded, for they are, as I have said, thesis 6, the proclamation of the divine remission. 39. It is very difficult, even for the most learned theologians, at one and the same time to commend to the people the bounty of indulgences and the need for true contrition. 40. A Christian who is truly contrite seeks and loves to pay penalties for his sins. The bounty of indulgences, however, relaxes penalties and causes men to hate them, at least it furnishes occasion for hating them. 41. Papal indulgences must be preached with caution, lest people erroneously think that they are preferable to other good works of love. 42. Christians are to be taught that the Pope does not intend that the buying of indulgences should in any way be compared with works of mercy. 43. Christians are to be taught that he who gives to the poor or lends to the needy does a better deed than he who buys indulgences. 44. Because love grows by works of love, man thereby becomes better. Man does not, however, become better by means of indulgences, but is merely freed from penalties. 45. Christians are to be taught that he who sees a needy man and passes him by, yet gives his money for indulgences, does not buy papal indulgences, but God's wrath. 46. Christians are to be taught that unless they have more than they need, they must reserve enough for their family needs and by no means squander it on indulgences. 47. Christians are to be taught that the buying of indulgences is a matter of free choice, not commanded. 48. Christians are to be taught that the Pope, in granting indulgences, needs and thus desires their devout prayer more than their money. 49. Christians are to be taught that papal indulgences are useful only if they do not put their trust in them but very harmful if they lose their fear of God because of them. 50. Christians are to be taught that if the Pope knew the exactions of the indulgence preachers, he would rather that the Basilica of St. Peter be burned to ashes than built up with the skin, flesh, and bones of his sheep. 51. Christians are to be taught that the Pope would and should wish to give of his own money, even though he had to sell the Basilica of St. Peter to many of those from whom certain hawkers of indulgences cajole money. 52. It is vain to trust in salvation by indulgence letters, even though the indulgence commissary, 
or even the Pope, was to offer his own soul as security. 53. They are enemies of Christ and the Pope who forbid altogether the preaching of the word of God in some churches, in order that indulgences may be preached in others. 54. Injury is done the word of God when, in the same sermon, an equal or larger amount of time is devoted to indulgences than to the word. 55. It is certainly the Pope's sentiment that if indulgences, which are a very insignificant thing, are celebrated with one bell, one procession, and in one ceremony, then the gospel, which is the very greatest thing, should be preached with a hundred bells, a hundred processions, and a hundred ceremonies. 56. The treasures of the Church, out of which the Pope distributes indulgences, are not sufficiently discussed or known among the people of Christ. 57. That indulgences are not temporal treasures is certainly clear, for many indulgence preachers do not distribute them freely, but only gather them. 58. Nor are they the merits of Christ and the saints, for even without the Pope, the latter always work grace for the inner man and the cross, death, and hell for the outer man. Tis the gift to be simple. Tis the gift to be free. Tis the gift to come down where we ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, twill be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we will not be ashamed. To turn, turn, will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. Life is complex. Join us for the simple gifts of wisdom, love, and delight in the written word. The 95 Theses of Martin Luther, Theses 59 through 95. 59. St. Lawrence said that the poor were the treasures of the church, but he used the term in accordance with the custom of his own time. 60. We do not speak rashly in saying that the treasures of the church are the keys of the church and are bestowed by the merits of Christ. 61. For it is clear that the power of the Pope suffices by itself for the remission of penalties and reserved cases. 62. The true treasure of the Church is the Holy Gospel of the glory and the grace of God. 63. It is right to regard this treasure as most odious, for it makes the first to be the last. 64. On the other hand, the treasure of indulgences is most acceptable, for it makes the last to be the first. 65. Therefore, the treasures of the gospel are nets which, in former times, they used to fish for men of wealth. 66. The treasures of the indulgences are the nets today which they use to fish for men of wealth. 67. The indulgences, which the merchants extol as the greatest of favors, are seen to be, in fact, a favorite means for money-getting. 68. Nevertheless, they are not to be compared with the grace of God and the compassion shown in the cross. 69. Bishops and curates, in duty bound, must receive the commissaries of the papal indulgences with all reverence. 70. But they are under a much greater obligation to watch closely and attend carefully, lest these men preach their own fancies instead of what the Pope commissioned. 71. Let him be anathema and accursed who denies the apostolic character of the indulgences. 72. On the other hand, let him be blessed who is on his guard against the wantonness and license 
of the pardon merchant's words. 73. In the same way, the Pope rightly excommunicates those who make any plans to the detriment of the trade in indulgences. 74. It is much more in keeping with his views to excommunicate those who use the pretext of indulgences to plot anything to the detriment of holy love and truth. 75. It is foolish to think that papal indulgences have so much power that they can absolve a man even if he has done the impossible and violated the mother of God. 76. We assert the contrary and say that the Pope's pardons are not able to remove the least venial of sins as far as their guilt is concerned. 77. When it is said that not even St. Peter, if he were now Pope, could grant a greater grace, it is blasphemy against St. Peter and the Pope. 78. We assert the contrary, and say that he, and any Pope whatever, possesses greater graces, namely the gospel, spiritual powers, gifts of healing, etc., as is declared in 1 Corinthians 12. 79. It is blasphemy to say that the insignia of the cross with the papal arms are of equal value to the cross on which Christ died. 80. The bishops, curates, and theologians who permit assertions of that kind to be made to the people, without let or hindrance, We'll have to answer for it. 81. This unbridled preaching of indulgences makes it difficult for learned men to guard the respect due to the Pope against false accusations, or at least from the keen criticisms of the laity. 82. They ask, for example, why does not the Pope liberate everyone from purgatory for the sake of love? A most holy thing and because of the supreme necessity of their souls. This would be morally the best of all reasons. Meanwhile, he redeems innumerable souls for money, a most perishable thing, with which to build St. Peter's Church, a very minor purpose. 83. Again, why should funeral and anniversary masses for the dead continue to be said? And why does not the Pope repay, or permit to be repaid, the benefactions instituted for those purposes, since it is wrong to pray for those souls who are now redeemed. 84. Again, surely this is a new sort of compassion on the part of God and the Pope, when an impious man, an enemy of God, is allowed to pay money to redeem a devout soul, a friend of God, while yet that devout and beloved soul is not allowed to be redeemed without payment for love's sake, and just because of its need of redemption. 85. Again, why are the penitential canon laws, which in fact, if not in practice, have long been observed and dead in themselves, why are they today still used in imposing fines in money through the granting of indulgences, as if all the penitential canons were fully operative? 86. Again, since the Pope's income today is larger than that of the wealthiest of wealthy men, why does he not build this one church of St. Peter with his own money, rather than with the money of indigent believers? 87. Again, what does the Pope remit or dispense to people who, by their perfect penitence, have a right to plenary remission or dispensation? 88. Again, surely greater good could be done to the church if the Pope were to bestow these remissions and dispensations, not once, as now, but a hundred times a day, for the benefit of any believer whatever. 89. What the Pope seeks by indulgences is not money, but rather the salvation of souls. Why then does he not suspend the letters and indulgences formerly conceded, and still as efficacious as ever? 90. These questions are serious matters of conscience to the laity. To suppress them by force alone, and not to refute them by giving reasons, is to expose the Church and the Pope to the ridicule of their enemies, and to make Christian people unhappy. 91. If, therefore, indulgences were preached in accordance with the spirit and mind of the Pope, 
all these difficulties would be easily overcome and, indeed, cease to exist. 92. Away, then, with those prophets who say to Christ's people, Peace, peace, where there is no peace. 93. Hail, hail, to all those prophets who say to Christ's people, The cross, the cross, where there is no cross. 94. Christians should be exhorted to be zealous to follow Christ, their head, through penalties, deaths, and hells. 95. And let them thus be more confident of entering heaven through many tribulations, rather than through a false assurance of peace. Tis the gift to be simple. Tis the gift to be free. Tis the gift to come down where we ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, twill be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we will not be ashamed. To turn, turn, will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right. <laughs>